it is a pleasure to uh, zoom in with uh, <laughs> with ice sculptress, uh, incredible baker <laughs> of of souffles, of apple pies, if I if remember correctly. Uh, <laughs> Trapeze artist, amazing, mm -hmm. amazing stand-up mm -hmm. and tireless crusader for women's rights, mm -hmm. Liz Winstead. Yay! Ah, Yay. that's Yay. a nice. Thanks for remembering my baking skills, Laura, because it's my literally the thing I'm the most proud of. It's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I it, you came over. You were living on like 20th Street, I think. I was I was on 17th. And uh, you would come over with treats. Yeah. Baked goods. I did that or a lot. Or were you on 28th? I was on 26th, 22nd, 21st, uh -huh. and 20th before then I get <laughs> made it down to the village and finally Brooklyn. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's awesome. But what would you bake? I did not know that Liz Winstead was a She's baker. She's incredible. What, yeah. What's your uh, I bake anything from pies to cookies I can make soufflés. I can make cakes. Mm. Um, but I love... <gasps> She's the pride of Minnesota. Pride of Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. So I can I can whip up some rhubarb. Very. It's like the that's like the the state weed of Minnesota. <laughs> uh -huh. So, but you're phoning in from Minnesota today. Correct? I am phoning in from uh, the great state of Minnesota. How are things? Did you watch the State of the Union? Of course you did. I did. I did. Um, you know, and Biden. You know, he didn't screw up. I feel like, yeah, except for calling yeah, yeah. human beings illegals, which wasn't great. Uh, and he didn't say the word great. abortion when he was talking about abortion. So that's always disappointing. Yeah. yeah. Liz, how do you keep uh, sane and uh, and everything with all the work you do with fighting for, you know, women's rights, reproductive rights? Like, how do you not get down about just all this, this shit that you're up against? Like, I, that it changes constantly. I know. You know, I think the honest to God thing is... Um, when I when I kind of did this shift, oh, some balloons just flew up. I don't know, I know what that I was. I just saw them too. The, I kind of no, did It was thing. when things got real serious, the balloon showed up. Is that up. yours? I don't know. <laughs> the balloons I just felt like that. The balloons started flying up. Um, I, oh, wait. Uh, Roe v. Wade has just been codified. Wow. Uh, I can't amazing. believe it. You released. Um, no, I oh honestly. God. That's the balloons. <laughs> I honestly think that. <laughs> Actually doing the work is what keeps me sane. Taking in the information um. with no outlet. I, I honestly don't know how human beings read the news without actually being able to act on it. And I think for me, mm -hmm. knowing that I am such a great consumer of news, that I had to add the component of activism into my life. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, mm -hmm. I would just, I would feel really hopeless. And you know, with the work that we do at Abortion Access Front, so much of it is on the ground working with the providers and the activists in these hard hit states. And every time mm -hmm. you meet somebody or put a face to why you care, it, you think of that face. Uh -huh. And every day I wake up and I'm like, yeah. I am doing this for the folks in Alabama and Oklahoma and Texas and Mississippi. And I think that's that's how I do it. And so I highly encourage you guys, everyone, like carve out some time to come out with us because it, it's kind of life changing. And well, and you mentioned Abortion Access Front, which is a, a huge organization. I did y'all did a show in like a fundraiser and stuff in Texas, but there was a natural. What was it? V from V, v to, to Shining, Shining v. v. Yeah. So I feel like you guys are approach uh, uh, approachable as an organization to get involved or at least because I'm also a huge consumer of news. Mine's more just like addicted to the format and it's kind of a joke to me, but I watch news all the time. Are you constantly plugged into what is being broadcast? I, I am plugged in and I'm, all, I'm also plugged into the shit news, right? So I'm watching all the news because I just... I kind of want to see what the hot takes are that are being offered up to people on every spectrum. And then mm -hmm. I also read the news as well. And so, yeah, I bring it in a lot. And I think, um, and I think that one of the things that I think I do get the most annoyed with in reading the news and taking in the news is how much of it is this, this political horse race that talks about the human condition as uh as a, as how it will benefit 
one political party or another, rather than talking about yeah. these different conditions as human beings mm-hmm. going through shit and how people should fix it. And I'm, and I'm always, yeah. that's when I shake my fist at cloud, you know, like an old man, yeah. because yeah. it's just like, yeah. there's never humanity, you know, there's never like, right. there's never the humanity, you know? So sometimes I feel like they just interview these prognosticators and these pundits instead of like, the real world people who are having the experiences that are a result of the shitty things that these people are doing. Because once you add yeah. humanity, like you can look away, but you can't unsee mm. the person who's being affected mm. by yeah. the policies. Right. I always think too, like I mean, the one thing, because I've been thinking about you and your work and just all of it, uh, how women's rights are being taken away gradually. It's like the one thing that all religions have in common is downgrading women like women are here to procreate and uh serve men and that's with every religion we're second class Mm -hmm. we're you know and what kills me is like when uh when women aren't pro-women you know and it's usually because of religion yeah and i think that we're at a point now where it's gotten to these next level um places that we're going. And I think like when people ask me like, what do you think the most horrible abortion bans are? It, it, I sort Uh of surprise them when I always say it's the waiting periods. And the reason I say that Mm -hmm. is um, when you say that society has decided that women need to wait 24, 48 hours before they can have their abortion. That's not just about Mm -hmm. abortion. That's deciding Mm -hmm. that there is a competency Mm -hmm. with which we don't trust women to make decisions. And that if we Uh. solidify that as a society, then we're saying, oh, I don't really know if I can trust you to make like fast decisions running my bank or, you know, being mm -hmm. a doctor. And it it devalues us as competent. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, when now you start talking about – punishing women who've had abortions um, and calling them Mm -hmm. like murderous and really throwing that murder shit around. Now you've got a situation where uh, you're murderous incompetence. And that means (laughs) we need Ah. to take the whole of your decision making away. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so awful. Mm -hmm. And it's like when you step outside of it, like that a person can't make a decision about their own body, you know, without a bunch of old white guys weighing in, is it's disgusting. Yeah, I mean, I've had an abortion, and I, I my my joke is that I had an abortion, and uh, it's true what they say. It's it's how it's hard to outlive your kids, but <laughs> I, <laughs> but Liz, I you know I was lucky when I had mine. I did it at the OBGYN, so and it wasn't. I knew instantly I was pregnant or something was wrong because I felt like I'd been kicked in the back by a horse. It was like in the lower back. It was horrible. Mm-hmm. And I, um, the pregnancy was terminated the same day that the doctor also delivered a baby, you know, the same OBGYN. And so and I know we were saying like in, in med- medical circles, that's called the leave a penny, take a penny. But we, <laughs> yeah, I keep working, working in my f-ing bits. No, but, but really, uh, I, it wasn't a big deal to get it. You know, yeah. it wasn't a big deal. It was like probably I was like three weeks in and I just said, uh, God, I'm pain, and I I know this isn't going to work. And it was like, okay, I'll, we'll do it for you. We'll make an appointment. And that was it. While yeah. I, you know, like the next couple of days, I went in. Well, in Texas, especially that's where I'm from, and as as a poor person in Texas, like Planned Parenthood was one of the only places that would take my work and sh- that I could get medical. St- I could get a checkup there if I needed an STD sweep. So like men were there constantly, not even utilizing something like Planned Parenthood. Right. For uh, abortion resources and things like that, but and I only, I know Texas more just because that's where I'm from. But the laws there currently are nuts. Like the financial penalties, the criminal aspect of are you the doctor? Are you the person who drove to the clinic? Like they yeah. really are criminalizing these people, and 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 it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, I believe, in some cases. Like two hundred fifty. Really if you were yeah, changing. it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. 10 year fine loss of medical license um, for the physician. And if you are uh, somebody who just was the Uber driver, somebody that person could be technically fined 
um, 10 grand for taking someone to the clinic. Ugh. And, and, and let it be clear that Uber driver could literally be turned in because let's say he was having a mm-hmm. drink at Starbucks, right? He got at Starbucks and he was mm-hmm. looking at his phone and he got a passenger call that said, pick me up here, going to whole women's health clinic. Um, if somebody oversaw that on his shoulder, they could turn him in. Like that's how that law yes. works. Oh, God. And, and the way that law was crafted is that there's no legal recourse for the person who's ratted out. So the Uber driver can't sue the person who reported him or any of that. They're, they wrote it that way, correct? Yes. And he can't, if he has to get a lawyer to defend himself, he can't recoup the mm-hmm. fees for the lawyer he had mm-hmm. to get um, on that as well. And so it's and the fact that the Supreme Court upheld this as some kind of thing that you can do because it's nebulous, because it's yeah. civil. Right. It's not it's a citizen action. And so because it's not a law, yes. it's a citizen action. That's mm-hmm. why the Supreme Court was like, what do you want mm-hmm. us to do? We didn't pass the law. It's not exact, a law. But that, Damn. But that was the whole reason they structured it that way. Yep. Was so it could not be knocked down yep. through the normal. Because this is why Ted Cruz is such a fucking monster, right? Especially people in Ted. Because he's Supreme Court. He's well read when it comes to the Supreme Court. Well, he was a solicitor they, general, He, you know, for the state of Texas. So he is mm-hmm. actually, he's argued mm-hmm. cases before the Supreme Court as well, before he was... The Ted Cruz we all know and hate. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my Christ. <laughs> oh, God, God. It's so it's ugly. Wild. It's crazy. And even thinking about the fact that they also framed it that way so that there's a chilling effect, right? Because it's so nebulous, mm. everybody's like freaking oh. out about, it, it, is this going to happen to me? Do I want to take this risk? Yeah. You know, physicians were like, uh. every step of the way, um, I'd like to save your life, but I am i don't know if I can. So I'll tell you what, go to the parking lot, bleed out, and then drag your Mm -hmm. bloody ass self to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And when your organs start failing, then that is when it is legal okay for legally okay for us to interview. god almighty yeah yeah it's so crazy who was the woman it was just <clears throat> in the house or maybe it was that who's that horrible man from louisiana it's john kennedy right that's his name oh yeah john Ke- well there's Did john kennedy that? there's when also mike he- johnson there's many horrible men from louisiana so pick your poison friend yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah he had like an atrocious approach to trying to and there was a woman there who told a very traumatic story about having to have a late-term abortion or 20 week i think and then he was going on a 21 week and just just this very barbaric way to humiliate this woman and it's wild that a mom would have to even jump through those hoops after going through that just to yeah. prove prove her point or prove her case or it's anything. So awful. Uh, I had a friend in Austin, Texas, who was a doula, but also worked at an abortion clinic, uh-huh. um, and she actually loved both of her jobs because yeah. she she uh, realized she was helping both like people you, at both at both. Places. One of the things one could do as a volunteer at several clinics is become an abortion doula, which is you hold the mm. hand of somebody who came in by themselves so that they aren't alone. It's a mm-hmm. really rewarding, it's a really mm-hmm. rewarding thing to do. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, the I numbers. would do that in a second. I'd like to learn how to give abortions. Oh, I can I'd teach like you. I'd like to ha- take a truck around. I know how to do an aspiration mm-hmm. abortion. Wow. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I can show you, teach you on a papaya. How do people get involved? Because it's a, it's obviously not just a woman's issue, obviously, but like what what are ways that you look for people to volunteer and get activated other than voting and calling senators and all that and protesting. So something that's pretty cool that we do at abortion access front is we have a whole program um, that's called operation save abortion. And it's like, you can watch a five part series on sort of all the different buckets that you can sign up to. If like taking to the streets and direct action is your jam, you can learn how to do that. If, uh, doing abortion funding and dueling and helping clinics is your jam. You can do that policy legislative. You can do that, but we have an activist calendar on that site. It's operation save abortion.com. And you can look through by state and see how you can help. Mm-hmm. And then also if you just email programs at abortion access front and say, can we talk? Cause I'd love to talk through 
we ask you questions that you might not think about what activism means, right? It's like, are you good at mm-hmm. math? Are you organized? Are you, you know, what's your skill set? And then we can hook you up with people who need skills. You just can't believe how many skills uh, that you can, you know, if there's a clinic that needs mm-hmm. a graphic design for a thing they're doing, like that's helpful. There's 9 million ways that you can help. And we pair up people with clinics in need. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty great. We also have a simple program called Adopt a Clinic um, that if you go to our website, you'll see it. And it's a, all the all, clinics and activists all over the country create wish lists. And sadly, we use Amazon because mm-hmm. it's it's just the easiest way to access. And yeah. I hate to say it, but we do. Um, sure. But you can adopt sure. a clinic and help them fulfill their needs. Anything from diapers for existing children to heating pads to um, snacks for staff. Like it's that's a really cool way to do it too. If you feel like I don't really have a lot of money, but maybe I could buy somebody some hand warmers while they're out there in the winter escorting patients, you know, Mm. I'd like to be able to do that. Um, So we hook up people, we try to meet them, meet them where they are as far as the time commitment they have, um, their abilities, whether, you know, are you an able-bodied person? Are you a not able-bodied person? And we like to talk to people, you know, are, if, cause if you're thin skinned, you don't want to escort cause those monsters out there, like that's mm-hmm. not your jam, mm-hmm. but you know, do you want to hold somebody's hand? Liz, have you done escorting where they had, where the protesters are of the, of the escorts into the abortion clinic have like keyed you or anything? I have been actually keyed. I've actually been what I call nailed. So, um, oh my what, God. in the early, early, early days before there was laws against keeping protesters a certain amount of people away, um, I was, uh-huh. it was one of the first times that I ever escorted and I was, uh, we were locking hands and I was wearing shorts. Uh-huh. And so the first rule of escorting is you never Wait, wear shorts. Liz, where were you? I was in Minnesota. So the first rule oh, of sorry, escorting okay. is you never wear shorts, you always wear pants. And so what they would do is they would have those protest signs And at the bottom of the sign, Mm -hmm. they would have a teeny tiny nail at the bottom of the sign. And they would walk through and just scrape your legs, right? So that you would let go of your grip. And then they would keep walking Uh before you even know what happened. And then their their secondary foot soldiers would come in once you lost the grip. And then they would take control of the door. And then they would plop down in front of the door. Um, until the cops came. God. So blocking people to come in. That's, so um, that yeah. was an old that's ass crazy. trick um, that you learn your lesson mm-hmm. once, but like, that's the kind of dirty tricks they do. And um, it's kind of astounding, but in our travels and we've been as an organization, um, we've probably traveled to 35 States, hundreds of clinics. And the cool, one of the coolest happenstances that that we did was, you know, we stay in a town for like, I don't know, four or five days because we're fixing up the clinic and doing a show and then and then helping at the clinic if they need escorting and stuff. And so we'd get together and talk and and these escort teams and these activists would just regale us with stories about the anti-abortion terrorism that happened. And they knew each other. They knew yeah. the names of these people and they knew like, you know, uh-huh. what church they went to and stuff. But nobody had ever written it down. Right. So it was kind of this stories. And so we were like, have you guys started any kind of database? And no one had. So we started collecting the names and the churches. And we now at Abortion Access Front have ended up with the largest anti-abortion database in the country. And we started joining their churches secretly and clandestinely. And so um, (laughs) with fake Facebook names and stuff. And so when January 6th happened, (laughs) we watched all of this chatter in all of these different churches. So we assigned people to monitor and we busted 30 of these anti-abortion extremists with footage and stuff at the Capitol and turned them over to the FBI. Shut up. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I know. Amazing. Isn't that That's crazy? Incredible. Just like happenstance of just talking. We were like, well, let's organize this for people. And then we provide that database yeah. to um, to clinics and to escorts. They can pull reports. And so it's like, and they'll send mm-hmm. us information like this guy. Do you know this guy? And uh, we've got all the pictures. Yeah. And then we'll, if we wow. don't know the guy, we throw him in the database. If we do know the guy, we're like, yeah, that's Bob Anderson. Um, he, he got busted in North wow. Carolina 
And um, if he comes near your door, take a picture because we can get him arrested. So, yeah. Wow. And li- Liz, is it mostly men? Oh, the honey, anti-abortion, yes. Anti-abortion? Uh, men mm-hmm. and they're mm-hmm. like, you know, just sad, sad wives. And here's the sad part. When it's not mostly men, it's men and their wives. And then they drag their children. And so you have these the little kids, kids, they bring the kids out yeah. there and, you know, and they're holding these signs that are like, we'll adopt your baby. I'm like, and then bring them to the abortion yeah. clinic when they're five. <laughs> you no. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I mean, that's what kills me. I, I mean, I, I just think like, OK, women, OK, men who aren't pro-choice uh, or pro-woman, that's that's everything that's everywhere it's always been everywhere but when women aren't pro women that kills me and i think what you're not what, what, what women aren't thinking is that you're and men you're ta- you're not only are you taking away a woman's right you're taking away you know uh to have an abortion you're taking away their future like whatever they had planned for themselves mm-hmm. by making them have a kid mm-hmm. And whatever, you know, it's just, it, it, my, and I, I get really frustrated about this because uh, my mom, uh, you know, as I always I say, was a single mom and she felt like she had no choice. My dad was married. She was having an affair and I got pregnant, but she had big plans that were then curtailed because, she, you know, she had to get, she had to support me and herself. So she didn't get to do anything she wanted to do. Yeah. And, and I won't let thing. her do anything she wants now. It's also Laura's still super... resentful that she's here. Yeah. <laughs> Laura, I'm glad that you weren't. I used to ask my mom when I was like 12, "Can you get an abortion? Is it too late?" <laughs> that's a retroactive. Yeah, that's what I used to say. I said, "Say 12 years, not 12 weeks," yeah. or, and um, she'd say, "It's too late." But like, given the current situation, this is like a macro question, like nationally speaking. Because it's all over the states are doing everything different since Roe v. Wade was overturned. What does like the the big long game solution or next chapter look like? Because does there have to be a case that goes to the Supreme Court to get it back on the other side? Or does it stick to where it's just states rights and that's where we're going to leave it? Like what do you see as the next steps after Roe v. Wade was overturned? You know, it's so um, complicated because while it's really exciting to have um, these states, you know, voting to codify abortion into their state constitutions, um, that's just not enough because everybody deserves the right to abortion. And also, if you're not going to vote out the monsters that make these laws in the first place, you're just going to be in a cyclical hell. Um, There's a case going before the Supreme Court. next in in the end of uh, March that is going to challenge whether or not the abortion pill was um, expanded too quickly and whether or not this Mm. old ass law, this is wild y'all. So this is where we're at. Um, Mm. They're deciding two things. One, whether or not the FDA rushed through this, these expansions of the abortion pill and, and should we roll it back to only being able to take it up to seven weeks and having to do it in person, which would literally be mm. a seven week abortion ban and be terrible. But the worst part is right. they're well, also it's... considering a law that has been on the books since 1873 called the Comstock Act, where this busybody man in the Grant administration decided he was real mad about amoral things being sent through the mail. He literally, this is so typical projection, right? Fat, ugly, unfuckable white guy who is just a citizen Yeah, was Nick- mad. And so he decided that he would get all this shit shipped to him, dildos, Poor, I don't know what kind of dildos you got. Probably you got slivers from them back in 1873. But dildos. Yeah, it, I was, it, was, <laughs> right? it was certainly made of wood. Yes. Porn, all this stuff. Victorian. Yeah. yeah. And then, so he collects all this shit. And then he goes marching up to Washington, down to Washington, D.C. He's in New York with with like, you know, wheelbarrows or I don't know, Wells Fargo wagons full of uh, salacious materials. And then stands before Congress and he's like, mm. look at all this shit you can get. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's it's making yeah. our, our nation terrible. <laughs> oh my and God. they're like, you're right. Let's ban sending abortifacients, birth control, and dildos mm. and porn through the mail. 
And he's like, thanks. See ya. Mm -hmm. It was never repealed. It's on the books. And because it's yeah. on the books, the, 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 the right wing people bringing this case before the Supreme Court is literally saying, we can't send this shit through the mail. It says right here, it's a law, a federal law. So we should not be able to send abortion pills oh. through the mail. The fact that the Supreme Court mm -hmm. took up this argument and is says it's a legitimate right. thing. We should all be terrified. Like legal argument, right? Right. But that is you no. Know, how... But uh, when you think about it too, like w w the senator who was most adamant against gay marriage, and then like a month later, who was blowing guys in oh. the, the bathroom stall of the Greyhound station. It, it, it it's kind. Of, you know who I'm talking about? No, but those are my favorite kind of Republicans. Like, it's always them. But <laughs> it that, is. Let's but keep it to the bathroom stalls in the Greyhound in the Greyhound bus station. Yeah. <laughs> Keep yeah. it there. But they did the exact same thing when when the Supreme Court sided with gay marriage Sorry. and the states were freaking out. Uh, what they did in I'll reference Ted Cruz again. Uh, a lot of people said he should have been disbarred for telling people to just ignore the Supreme Court ruling. But what they did was they looked up this old law that was on the books from slave days where the racist southern states didn't want to recognize interracial marriages or out of state marriages where the laws were allowed in the north. So when a black and white couple came to Texas, they're like, we don't want to honor this. So they fell back on those laws from... <sighs> the 1800s that said, oh, look, we don't have to, because people were getting gay married in Boston and SF, right? That, yeah. Those were two places. So they were scared that, but that's what they fell on. I was like, are we not recognizing the context that that law was written was steeped in racism and slavery yeah. and, and inhumane actions. And that's what your legal defense is. But that's well, how they also, play. Yeah. when they overturned Roe, Clarence Thomas wrote, in his opinion, you know, abortion is not protected under the 14th Amendment because it's not mentioned in the constitution. And he actually continued mm. to say, mm -hmm. uh, neither, birth control is not mentioned in the constitution. Marriage equality is not mentioned in the constitution. And we should go back and revisit those things. Now, um, I don't Correct. know how he feels about interracial marriage, but my guess is that Clarence Thomas might want to ban <laughs> interracial marriage because he doesn't know how to divorce yeah. that monster of a wife that he's married to. It's like, oh, bitch, Jamie. Right. I'm sure... Yeah. yeah, I can't divorce you. I'm scared of you, no. but he, I'm gonna make our marriage illegal. Yeah. Oh my god, he married a Wookie. That woman is the scariest fucking person, and she's a goddamn. Excuse me, I curse so much when I get into. It. She's an insurrectionist like that. I call her the gin surrectionist. Totally glossed over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, but even all that, like her messaging Ugh. people and organizing with stuff, and, and that was really glossed over. And I think the insurrection in general has been sort of glossed over. But her participation in in particular, and then. The that he doesn't recuse himself on all matters of mm -hmm. election fraud or insurrection. It's like, what? We don't talk. It's like, I bet you don't. I bet yeah. you don't. <laughs> <laughs> How else could you be together so long? I bet you don't. <laughs> Here's what's crazy. Why aren't you pro-choice? That's what I want to know. Is, uh, <laughs> you've gone a long way. You know what, you guys? Change your mind. Wrong? I've seen the light. <laughs> and <laughs> oh God almighty. I love the I love the women who call themselves pro-life who are postmenopausal and they'll get on stage at every pro-life like um uh convention and they'll be like, you know, I've had four abortions and I've regretted every one of them. And it's like, oh my God, your I got <laughs> oh, mindness is so intense. And they're always putting these yeah. women up. I'm like, <laughs> you know, you you could have you could have <laughs> stopped having abortions. Like nobody forced you. Liz, I thought you're, where you were going with that was it's easy for you to say you, you, it's fine for other women to have kids now that you can't. Oh, it is. Make that other is their women whole thing. Just because or, you can't. Yeah, that kind of like, shit. Or like I can't have another abortion and I regret all the ones I had. So now I'm some icon. What? Um, I want somebody to be stuck with a kid. I can't be. <laughs> I'm your kid. No, I just like I'm talking about them. That's why I'm here. Yeah, no. Um, no, I was just asking about your, like, you're a comedian and a writer, but also in, an activist. Do those things, have those always been hand in hand and together? Because I see you as all three of those things kind of simultaneously. Yes. She's always been incredibly smart and outspoken Where and did funny. you meet Laura? I want to know that. Where did y'all first meet? I want to know. In New York, Boston. right? Oh, shit. You're kidding me. I think Boston? Boston. Yeah. Because I would come to Boston <laughs> And um, sometimes I would stay with Dana Gould and Dan Spencer. Sometimes I would stay with Janine. 
and you were friends with Janine uh-huh. at, at the time. And I think yeah. we met in Boston. And then we both moved to New York. Sort of that's maybe I'm wrong on that. But we were all we were living in Chelsea and just like I just always loved Laura and I always loved Laura's work. And I was like, this is great. I felt like safe that the that the future of comedy was gonna be good if Laura Keitlinger was in it. Mm-hmm. Oh, good lord. You're I the sweetest. You, you too. No. And you know, Liz, I was thinking like, okay, you do benefits and stuff, and because I'm really lazy and can't drive. I mean, I could go to a clinic, I'm sure, and help. And I probably, I probably, I'm going to say I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> no, but you know what I was thinking? You probably already are doing this, but I would like your East Coast ass to come out here and we'll do some big show event for uh, Abortion Access Front on Mother's Day. F- thank you for not forcing me to be a mother event. So here's the thing. I don't know when Mother's Day is, but I'm going to be in in the... West Coast from the 8th until around the 16th. Um, and so maybe of May of May. Yeah. And I think oh, we have to then. OK. And also, yeah, because um, that would be really fun. Thank you for not making me be a Mother's Day. But we'll co- we'll definitely we'll co-host this thing and Daniel will feature. We'll we'll do some. We'll find a theater and raise some money. Is there is the lady's name Marsha Blackburn? She's the oh, rep from Tennessee. That is a lady's name from Tennessee. Right. I hate the way she talks because the way she says because because she always says because like well we can't get anything done because the Democrats are like I hate the way she says that word. She's she's atrocious. I'm sorry. She makes me. Uh, she sick. is atrocious. How- and she has that because voice, and that is like a. I'll mm-hmm. never forget when, like, this is taking us back a million years. But when, um, when Anita Hill was being grilled by the Senate, there was this Southern senator mm-hmm. named Howell Heflin from shockingly Alabama, and mm-hmm. I'll never forget him cross, <laughs> literally cross examining her and saying, "Ms. Hill, are you a scholar? Oh my God. woman!" And the way he oh, said, "Oh God, excuse me, it, it, are it you chills. a scholar woman?" And it was like, ah, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Joe Biden did too. Yeah, Joe Biden saying. was not nice. Oh, Joe he Biden. Was Joe Biden was one of the biggest assholes. Never about that. forget Joe Biden mm-hmm. not apologizing mm-hmm. to Anita Hill even. Liz names names. She knows where the bodies are buried because I like how you feel about like Nicole Wallace on MSNBC and all these kind of like defected Republicans who were trying to dig their way out of... I cannot believe it. Okay, but you're so good at it too. I mean, you you know what's going on. I was in I, I was in Santa Barbara time. last night. I was at a show. The comedian before me, and it's Santa Barbara, right? The comedian before me was doing all political stuff because he was like an impressionist, right? So George W. Bush came up, and he was like, "I liked him," which is such an old joke anyway, right? It's like twenty years too late. And then this one lady in the audience goes, "He was fun." And I just remember, I was like, that bitch doesn't even remember the Iraq war or like any of that. But you know, it was fun. Abu Ghraib. Were... Hilarious. A riot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, you know, it was a... <laughs> that was fun. So but fun. They, I truly... Lindy England. So fun. Oh. But I am truly, truly uh, unsure of what's going to happen this year. And uh, I'm not, not optimistic, but I totally think it's a, for grabs and i'm very 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 afraid of of one of the outcomes i think what it's gonna come down to is who's just not gonna turn out for trump versus who's not Mm. gonna turn out for biden because young Mm -hmm. progressives have are mad for about a lot of reasons they're mad about Mm -hmm. um this sort Mm -hmm. of blanket co-signing on israel you know, they don't want their mm-hmm. tax dollars and bombs mm-hmm. bombing c- civilians. And people are mad yeah. about that. Right. And so I don't mm-hmm. think those people totally. are going to vote for Trump, but I think there's a real chance they're not going to vote for Biden. Conversely, I agree yeah. um, that you have those mm-hmm. um, that's there's still that group of sort of Nikki Haley Republicans who they've been polling, <laughs> who 30 percent of them said, if Nikki Haley's not the nominee, I'm not voting at all. And so. What are those numbers mm-hmm. of people who are disenfranchised with both people? I think it's going to come down to that. Mm-hmm. And it, it is really worrisome. I feel I feel worrisome also. I just feel also that like, you know, I get very tired of being told by establishment people that this was, just, I mean, they just told us you have to vote for Biden because he's the only person that can beat Trump. You know, 
everybody just right. shamed us into thinking mm. that. And even just recently I posted on Instagram, um, like, please say the word abortion because when you don't, it makes somebody like me like feel shamed. And I, and that's not cool, right? Mm -hmm. And all yeah. these people screaming right. at me saying, how dare you during this time? And then one guy said, shame on you for posting that. Literally, unironically, he literally shamed me for saying, I really don't want to feel shamed. Yeah. And so in so many <laughs> issues, whether, right? uh, so whether you're trans, God you know, like, it. It, you know, and it's like, you know, your issue will come or you're queer, or, you know, yeah. it, all of it is, yeah. please don't make waves so that we can get this, these people elected. And at what point isn't, yeah. aren't we just valued? You know, what, at what point, why should, mm -hmm. why should I have to shut up and why shouldn't, the presidential candidates or politicians be the ones that have to sell themselves to us and, and, and make us mm -hmm. like, what is your policies? Why, you know, because it's terrible. Have, sending the woman out, the vice president, it's basically send the woman out to talk about woman things. Yeah. And it's like gross. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's gross. I found out not too recently that while I was working on this job, I found out I was getting paid less uh, uh, than the men, and it was I had the same job uh, th as they did, same title. And what I hear, what I kept hearing was, uh, just be grateful you have a job. And so it's like, okay, so you're saying by grateful you mean just shut up, mm -hmm. don't stick, don't stick up for yourself, mm -hmm. don't say anything about it, don't tell other women that we're getting paid less. Uh, just be grateful you have a, a job. And in that context, I uh, will say I am not grateful. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yes. like I know what you mean by that. Yeah. Be happy with less. Be happy that you're doing something, mm -hmm. but you're never gonna get what men get, and just well, like, also when Laura, they give the only other option you is zero. The, the tomatoes yeah. you buy at the grocery store don't cost less. You know, the gas you put in your yeah. tank doesn't mm -hmm. cost less. So what the fuck? Absolutely, that's a that's a great point. Yeah. Do you mix much in like? uh like TikTok and social media on like a political level, do you see like the conversations and things that are happening in those circles with like, yes. there's yeah, there's live debates with people uh, with Trump or Biden or just even Democrat, whatever the issue is, they make it a black and white, like a yes, no. The ones that, uh, TikTok to me is the platform where I have seen the most productive discourse in the comments where people mm. are very much engaged oh, and telling their stories. And like uh, Abortion Access Front's TikTok um, is very, like I highly recommend following it because we do a lot of stories. And like, you know, we posted about why people have abortions later in pregnancy and did a video about it. And then people said, I had to have this because of this. And then other people were saying, like, I never thought of it that way. I didn't know. And then it's and then of course you get trolls but for the most part you really do get people who want to learn and want to share their stories and i see real mm. uh real change real activism and really smart people um really doing good work there um in in ways that you know the classic example just as we watch the state of the union and that harebrained trad wife senator from <laughs> alabama right did you who, see that i didn't i <laughs> couldn't watch any of so it so really fast let me interrupt so we're we were we were just doing stuff at home and that I, we'd already watched the state of the union but then she came on in the background my boyfriend is not really that politically activated and so he the the majors he doesn't necessarily know so i could just hear her i could and i was like she this sounds looney tunes this is so kooks and so then I started tuning in and watching her. And then he came in and we're both looking at this. And I was like, this is one of those moments. Like, this wow. is really I have one to of those moments. I have to see it. But go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. But so, yes, you know, she's, that. it's like, first of all, it's on International Women's Day. And there she is in a kitchen <laughs> with this giant that. cleavage <laughs> cross. It's like, Jesus, yes. take my cleavage. Yes. And right. And so she's and so women are here in the kitchen where we're supposed to be. Where we're supposed to be. And then she's literally I'm a mom. And Joe Biden's oh my America God. is making me a pain. And it was so it weird. Is, oh my God. Yes. But, oh my God. And then she started talking about the dangers at the border. And I went down mm. to this town and I 
It was sitting on a panel and I heard the story of this woman who was <laughs> raped. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, this TikTok journalist mm -hmm. broke down her story, tracked down the woman. It was a story that was relayed to her about a woman mm -hmm. who was raped during the Bush administration in Mexico. <laughs> yes. oh, God. And it's like... Yeah, not even in the... Bitch, what? <laughs> yes. And so, I mean, but that's oh, yeah. the whole thing. When these corporate journalists are not doing their jobs, really smart, interesting people yeah, have yeah. come forth on TikTok to fill in the blanks. Like they're really, like you can just see. And, and, and I remember being this way when I first got excited about politics. Um, Randy Credico, who I know uh, Laura and yeah. I know very well, Daniel, I don't know if you know Randy Credico. He's kind of off the rails yeah. right now, but um, he is. Liz, you saw the documentary, right? Yes. I'm Randy, 60 Spins Around the Sun. Yes. I don't remember if you saw it or not. Yeah. Yes, you did a Got great job, okay, friend. But Randy okay, said to you. me, and this is the smartest thing anyone's ever said to me. When you read an article, if you do not gloss over a name you don't know, research that name. And then in every article you find about that person, learn those people because that's going to bring you to the truth because so often you'll just read an article where it's like, you know, president so-and-so met with Bob Anderson. And then you're like, and then you just get, we keep reading. You don't really look up Bob Anderson. And then you find out Bob Anderson is like, you know, somebody has been convicted of child molestation. And you're like, Whoa, mm -hmm. like, just like mm -hmm. Bob yeah. Anderson, the shoe clerk is also Bob Anderson, the convicted child molester. What the, you know, and TikTokers yeah. are really yeah. bringing that stuff to the forefront, and it's great. Yeah, Liz, I'm Im impressed with your patience on yet another level. Now you're still in touch with Randy Credico? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I, no. When he, yeah. no, during the 2016 elections, um, he was like shitting all over me for voting for Hillary, and I was what? like, "Hey, Randy, you and your privileged ass can go and die in a fire." Uh, I'm like out here every yeah. day doing the work <laughs> and I will not have you mm -hmm. yeah. who lived on my couch for free uh, telling me that somehow <laughs> yeah. I am part of the problem. I just won't have it. Like mm -hmm. take it, take it elsewhere. Yeah. Take it to the Nicaraguan embassy, mm -hmm. yeah. take it wherever you need to take it, but do not take <laughs> it to me. I did not call yeah. for you. Do not come for me. You know, when mm -hmm. we did the, when we did the uh, documentary at one point, a lot of a lot of his work with the Rockefeller drug laws was out. Of, I think was out of like guilt because he was a white person who could do coke and not go to jail. Yes, and everybody of every other color, of course, goes to to jail for that or did. And so, at one point, and we well, I I like pills too. But uh, at one point, Randy, when we were doing the the uh, thing in 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 Tulia, we were in Tulia, Texas. That's about to say the Rockefeller drug laws the, in Tulia, Texas are two. Th are, thank you for like. Just bringing that attention to everybody because those two stories are amazing. Yeah, yeah. that um, Daniel, I don't know if, it, but mm. Randy was kind of talking about the Tulia Forty Six, where all of these um, black people were arrested mm. without evidence, mm -hmm. no evidence. They were just uh, taken out of their homes and arrested, mm -hmm. you know, on drug charges mm -hmm. with no evidence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's an all white jury, and they say, "Well, do, didn't you want to know if, you know, that the prosecutor is, is asking? Well, or I mean, actually, the reporter was asking, didn't you want to know if uh, what?" how these people were found uh, with all these drugs like how did how did they get them or and they go no no we trusted we trusted the mm -hmm. lawyer we you know like so they didn't want any evidence anyway but while we were there in our rooms Ra randy storms into my room and this was we just got there just got to tulia and he said uh, the texas rangers are after us hide the tapes and all the tape we had was of like an obelisk that said Tulia, you know, and a cowboy boot. And I'm like, he's got me like all like hiding shit. And I was like, wait, we don't even have any. We have no footage. Like he always has to trump it up to like, or to make it like bigger than it is. Like all the intrigue and bullshit. And I said, we don't have anything. They can come in. And, and at that point I realized that he took my one, I had my pills in my little pill caddy. He took all of the pills out of my pill caddy and took them. And I said, and by the way, if the Texas Rangers are after us, you, they can fuck you and you won't get pregnant because you took my birth control pills, you <laughs> asshole. He took all my pills out of my thing. 
classic. <laughs> Texas will fuck you up, Laura. Texas will fuck you up. Classic. God almighty. It, we're, but just the stress. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry. That isn't going to make any sense to anybody. But. Where, where do you think the, like... I mean, it's a national issue. It's a state's issue. But like what states are kind of in the most desperate shape right now, do you think, in regards to access to abortion and and laws and policies being passed to restrict rights? Well, I mean, that's a loaded question because uh, right now there's 13 states that have zero access to abortion right off the bat. Like, Mm. no, no, no. Um, And then there's states Mm. that have these exceptions and as we've seen the exceptions play out um they don't work because if a lawyer not your doctor Mm -hmm. has set up a rule for how you prove you are the exception um it's a recipe for failure and death and destruction Mm -hmm. um so and also then you've got states that have available access but um those states are Overrun. Last year in Minnesota, 30% of the abortions provided were from people from Texas. So think about you being oh, a person man. from Texas, uh, how many states you had yeah. to travel through to, yep. to because you couldn't yep. get appointments. Because as you move around yep. and you're trying to find a place to go, if there is abortion yep. access, those appointments can take you past your gestational limit of getting of of needing care right. and then that means you go from right. a $500 abortion to a 5000 10000 abortion and you don't have that kind of money mm-hmm. right and so right now we're waiting for um the Florida Supreme Court to rule on whether or not uh their uh 6 week 15 week ban is uh unconstitutional um if they say it's unconstitutional Florida will remain um as the bastion in the South. But if they say, nope, you know what? That's it's perfectly fine. It's constitutional to have that ban. Um, they also passed a six week ban. Um, so what would happen is they would say the 15 week ban is fine. And then 30 days later, it would go to a six week ban, which would mean that um, if you live in, in between Texas and Florida and Florida and North Carolina, there is no abortion provision mm-hmm. for you in in the southern states. And Texas alone has 27 million women. So when you add mm-hmm. up those numbers, we're talking about over 50 million women without access to care. And God. if the Supreme Court decides that the FDA was too hasty in expanding access to medication abortion, uh, which a fact about medication abortion since it's been on the market since 2000. And so I'm going to do a little quiz. Abortion, a medication abortion has been on the market since 2000. 5.2 million people have used the abortion pill. How many deaths would you say have happened because of medication abortion with 5.2 million people using it? None. More than none. 100,000. 25. 25 wow. deaths in 5.2 million. So having said yeah. that, if the Supreme Court says, oh, it's unsafe, it's too rushed, we need to go back mm. to the 2000 uh, protocols, which would be seven weeks and in person only, that's basically a seven week abortion ban in the United States because most people use medication abortion. Um, 53% Mm -hmm. of all abortions that happen in the U.S. are with medication abortion. And because so many clinics have closed, in-clinic abortions aren't happening. And um, there's no clinics to prescribe the pills. So what do we do? So wait, Liz, this is RU486 that we're talking about. Yep, this is what we're talking about. Yep, medication abortion is RU486. Now, I think that should be in... uh gum machines outside yeah. uh, pharmacies. And <laughs> I was going to say the water. And, that's and, and cereal. Um, I like yeah, that. So, it's crazy. Yeah. I don't know that I answered your question, Daniel, um, because I, but it's, mm-hmm. it's like there's states that are terrible. There's states that are next level terrible. And then the states that are providing the care <laughs> are so overloaded that it's mm-hmm. um, everybody's really right now just desperate and scrambling. Who are your heroes? Who who motivates you? Who inspires you? I know you work with lots of like real people on the ground, but who are the people that Liz Winstead looks up to? You know, I guess I look up to the people who um, are providing the care at all costs. You know, as we speak today, 
And I don't know if you ever make mention of the day that you record your podcast, but today is uh, Abortion P- Provider Appreciation Day, and it's na- it, it's chosen oh. March 10th because Dr. David Gunn on this day was murdered in the parking lot of his clinic in 1993 mm. on March 10th. Um, oh, so, damn. you know, I really look I up to- I remember that. Yeah. I really look up mm-hmm. to people who, I don't know a lot of people who understand profoundly- the risk of being murdered to help somebody keep them on the path to their own destiny um, and get up and do it every day. And so for me, Mm -hmm. it's really those people who risk it all and their families risk it all. Uh, An abortion provider who is one of my heroes named uh, Renee Chelly, and she lives in Michigan. And um, there's a documentary coming out about the work of Abortion Access Fund. It's right now on the festival circuit called No One Asked You. Fantastic. Yeah. And so in the documentary, they filmed me just hanging out with Renee and talking. And um, and Renee said to me, um, every house I've ever lived in, I never hang curtains in my house because if somebody wants to murder me, I want to make sure they hit me and not my kids. Oh, my <sighs> And so that's, I know it's heavy, but like, and think about being like, those are the risks, but I don't want anybody who can't parent to be forced into a life. And I'm going to make that be my life's Mm -hmm. work. It's pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Did you meet Ann Richards ever? Or did you ever meet Molly? I got to interview Ann Richards when I was on Air America Radio, which was awesome, but Uh, I never met Molly Ivins. And I'm like... So I, bummed I, that I never met Molly. I butted Ivins. in a couple conversation. I bullied my way in just to meet her a couple times. I got to wait on her. I was a server at a restaurant. She'd come in. So I got to serve. Yes. Uh, and she was always read. She was always alone and she was always reading. And it was pre cancer, but then also when she was going through chemo, so she had no hair. Couldn't be nice. Like everything was just epic. She inspires me a lot because I know you work with uh, Cecile Richards, obviously, um, who we were talking about earlier. When did you meet? Uh, and uh, when have you met with Cecile for the first time? When I did the crazy traveling around with my dogs. and Did I tell you the story about traveling around the country with my dogs in a van? No. no. Okay. I couldn't remember no. where I said it. So the whole reason I got into this nuttiness, I was finishing writing my book and I was in Minnesota and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do next in my career. I don't know if anyone's ever going to hire me again. I was just kind of at a standstill. And it was when Wendy Davis was in Texas on the floor of Mm -hmm. the Texas house fighting this draconian abortion law. And she was filibustering and it wasn't on the news. I was was watching it on Twitter. Yeah. And so I started live tweeting Mm -hmm. it. Oh, I started live tweeting it. And then I met all these Texas activists and they were like, then, then they started tweeting me and then it started trending. And then finally the networks picked it up. But I was like, oh my God, this is insane. And then I did some research and I found out that that same Texas law was written by, uh, it was model legislation written by anti-abortion extremists and it was happening in 26 other states. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I called up Planned Parenthood and I said, I'm driving in my van with my two dogs back to New York. I want to drive around the country and meet people in your clinics and do fundraisers. And they were like, do we need to call the authorities? Like it just sounded like it's kind of a weird thing. <laughs> I'm in a van with my dog. Um, but yeah. So I drove all over America for 18 months by myself with my dogs wow. and raised money for independent clinics and Planned Parenthoods. And I visited these clinics. And that's when I found out like no one ever came to visit them. They didn't have community support. Mm-hmm. And so that's and so then I finally met Cecile Richards when I got back to New York and she was like, so you're the crazy vagabond who's been driving around the country. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's yeah. me. Uh, um, that's really brave too, Liz. Uh, uh, it's uh, commendable. It's incredible. Especially if you knew my dogs. It also seems dangerous. They were useless. <laughs> oh, useless. I saw one in the background. I saw a puppy milling around in the Ooh. background. Oh yeah, Miss, that's Very Mr. Cute. Funk. He's the well, new one. The other two have died. That's a good name. Mr. Funk? Mr. Funk. Oh. Or you can call him. Margaret Cho calls him Postmaster Funk. Yes. Oh, That's yeah. so good. Um, 
Well, Liz, I, you're such a hero to me. I feel like you you are in the same lineage of the people I like, loved and respected. I mention Ann Richards and Molly Ivins all the time because they're truly like heroes. They're such great writers yeah. and and well spoken activists, um, and can be political. I find without being like divisive. I'm an escalator, so I'm not always the best messenger. I mean, but, I'm an escalator uh, I, too. I, do... I just decide who I want to make sure the the bridge is burned. Like I want to, I want to put gas on that bridge. I want to light a match to that bridge, but I just want to be clear. I don't want them taking up space in my head. I don't. I if if you're yeah. not yeah fungible or movable, I don't. It mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Like that's who I want to. I just that's who I want to. Hopefully, like convince or inspire is somebody who's like just hasn't really thought about it in a way to be like you're right oh i can do that okay maybe now i will do a thing or be part of the thing because you know the haters yeah i don't got time for people who want me killed i don't i don't have time and you know i think we have to bring the word abortion into the vernacular it has to be more common and what what do you think about this abortion the musical I like abortion the musical. Here's here. So I have, which I will send you, Laura. I'll send you. We made shirts that yeah, say abortion. Yeah, I, I want to plug your book. Too. Abortion Yacht Club. Okay, okay, go, ahead, go ahead, Liz. Abortion Yacht Club. What? That's amazing. I'm sending you the shirt. They're great. I designed them. Um, we have like the Mifepristone yeah, Lodge. It looks like an old timey lodge. <laughs> like I like putting abortion in shit that's all over the place. One hundred percent. That's great. That's great. <laughs> well, Abortion Liz, is what's look, for I'm dinner. I'm serious about this. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I was behind. <laughs> I was behind this. Uh, I mean, I. And all, by the way, too, I think it, it's never uh, like such a. Fu- it's not like it's a fucking easy, like fun decision to mm-hmm, to get an abortion. Mm-hmm, of course, mm-hmm. the, people know that, but. I was behind a van that said "I heart abortion," and I was like, I kind of want to follow them because I appreciate that. Like, yeah, yeah. do you know? Just being out there and saying that, but um, I love I heard abortion. This. Let's yeah, we need to do May twelfth is-, is Mother's Day, so we could do a um, thank you for not forcing women to be mothers on Mother's Day uh, event, or I was thinking, we could, or even a uh, um, you can be a mother without giving birth by adopting the 64,000 orphans that are here because of... Oh, 400,000. Oh, yeah. There's, oh, zillions. Oh, my God. Yeah, oh, or you yeah, could adopt care. a That's clinic. That's kind of a long title. Or you could adopt a clinic with yeah. our program mm-hmm. on, on Mother's Day. But I right. think so, this yeah. would be fun. Right. And if so it was on brunch, Mother's Day. All right, we're going to talk more about this. I like it well, very can, much. Well, okay, well, we'll go over that. I'm going to email you and, and uh, arrange all this stuff. Yes, so I'm very excited about all right. of it. Also, okay. I want to do, Laura... Um, That's amazing. Uh, ...get together with a whole bunch of people like creative types, our comedy friends... And just have them over um, and talk about, like, here's all the shit we can do that's, like, low lift. Yeah. Because it's not always yeah, just yeah. performing. Like, it's <laughs> okay. home. So yeah. we can do that, too. We can have, like, a fun little Definitely. party. Definitely. Yay. I love it. I love Good. that term, low lift. Yeah. yeah. Low lift. Well, okay, so Liz. You're amazing, Liz. We You're love you amazing. So Shut up. Uh, talking with us. Nah, I'm so glad I got to, we got to see you. Look, I'm so excited because here's the deal. I did not know the two of you were doing a podcast together. And I was like, oh, my God, mm-hmm. I just met Daniel like, and, and hung out, and it was so fun. And then to reconnect yeah, with you, yeah. Laura, it's just like – and I thank you for thinking of me, too. Like, it really is nice to be thought of for like, <gasps> hey, put your voice on tape for this thing I'm doing or come be on our podcast. Yeah, It's really cool. I really appreciate yeah. it. Liz well, you're, Winstead you're is awesome. a voice. You you're are amazing. a voice. You're an amazing I'm performer so- and, and activist. And I'm so glad we get to reconnect. Too. Me yeah, too. Big time. Thank you for being here, Liz. Thanks thank so you, much. Thank you, thank I love you guys. Oh, wait, Liz, where do we get your book? Oh, oh yeah. Um, that's a good question. It's called Liz Free or Die. And um, <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's still in print, but like feel free. But honestly, uh. what I'd love for y'all to do is um, as this film is making its rounds in the festivals, um, and I'm hoping that when I'm in LA, yeah. there'll be a screening. It's called No One Asked You, and you can go to No One Asked You Doc dot com and you can find out mm-hmm. all about um, all of the festivals that it's going to be and it's in a whole bunch of them um, and maybe it's coming near you but like it gives Great. you a really good indication of like what we do and then how you can plug in wonderful Amazing. that sounds like, that will be terrific yes. good good thank Yay, you Liz Winston thank, thank you so much okay, I love Liz, you guys okay, we'll text you talk, okay, love, love you. you too thank you Liz okay.